Hi, this is another transformer video. I had a customer send me a new tone model 2540 master station for a repair. It hasn't worked for a long time and actually the repair of the master station is already done but she had another problem that I have to solve also. When the master station failed it killed her low voltage transformer. It sh the master station, the power supply in the 2540 shorted out it overloaded the transformer and it went poof and died. The models like the 2540 and the 2090 and the 2063, which are all models that came out in the mid or late 1960s and were in production for the most part through the early 1970s, use a fairly unique new tone transformer. These little transformers are rated at 30 volts at 20 watts. And these are the only models of intercoms that Newtone ever made that uses a transformer like that. And these transformers are, of course, no longer available. In fact, they haven't been available for probably over 20 years. And they just simply don't exist anymore. We looked everywhere we could think of, and we just can't find any anywhere. A 30-volt transformer is a rather odd item in today's world. It's fairly easy to find transformers that are 16 volts or 24 4 volts or maybe 18 volts, but no 30 volt transformers. At least nothing in this configuration. This is what's referred to as a class 2 transformer, which means it's all enclosed in a metal body. It has the 110 wiring on the back and it typically would be mounted to an electrical box and then the wires run from here to the intercom master station. Systems like the 2540 and the 2090, the transformers are mounted remotely away from the master station. They are typically in a utility area like a garage or a basement or the furnace or water heater area or something like that. They're not in the walls behind the master station. Part of my responsibility for the repair of her 2540 is to come up with a suitable replacement transformer and that's what this is all about. I have constructed transformers for customers before. I don't think I've ever done one for a 2540. So I did some looking around to see what I could find and the goal is we have to create a transformer that has the right voltage, has the right wattage, so it has enough power. It has to be able to be installed in a safe manner so there's no ex exposed electrical connections and it has to be able to be attached to a wall or ceiling or something like that so it's a permanent installation. That's what all of this is for. When you do something like this since it's sort of a one-off, safety is of the first concern. Did some looking around and the only transformer I could find that was a reasonable choice for to do this project is this. This is made by a company called Hammond and this is part of their 229 series. Little transformer right here is rated for 30 volts at 24 watts. So it has a little more capacity, which is not a problem. Having more capacity is fine as long as you don't get silly about it. You know, you don't want a 30 volt transformer that has the capacity of, you know, 120 watts, which would make it four times as big as this one because it's not that having the greater capacity, the 120 watts, would ever damage the intercom because the intercom is only going to use as much power from the transformer as it needs. It's just that you're paying for a lot more than what you really need. So you always want to pick something that's reasonably close. Again, this is 30 volts at 24 watts. This is a very flexible transformer. It has multiple different input and output connections on it. It can be wired up for 110 for the high voltage size or it could be wired up for 220. You can also, depending on how you hook up the output, you can set it up so where you're actually supplying 15 volts instead of 30, which we don't really care about that. The downside to this, and this was reasonably inexpensive, it was a fair price for what it is. Hammond is a good manufacturer and it is a quality transformer. However, you can see here these pins there and there. One side is input, one side is output. 
that's because this transformer is actually what would be considered a PC board or printed circuit board mount tra type transformer. It's designed to sit and sl the pins slide through holes on a circuit board and then it's soldered in. So this transformer is designed to become part of a product more than being a standalone transformer on its own. That creates a few challenges to convert it into something that we can use. However, I think I have that part figured out. For the safety and mounting aspect, we're going to use this. This is a PVC weatherproof enclosure. It's a 4x4x2 four by four by inch, so it's not huge. And actually, the transformer fits down inside of it nicely. And it's going to be attached to the, into the inside of the box. And then there are access holes for the wiring to come through here to power the transformer. And we're going to put a terminal block on the other side for the output of the transformer. And then at the end, when this is installed, it'll have a cover over it. An enclosure like this is perfectly safe for an application. In fact, that's what this is meant for. So it's a good choice for that type of application. Of course, after we get the transformer mounted in the box and some wiring done on it, we're going to have to do things like put a terminal block on one side so she has a place to connect the wires that come from the transformer. Of course, for safety, we're going to put a fuse. We're going to fuse the output of the transformer. That's one of the problems with the original style of transformer. They don't, they're small enough that they don't re, aren't required to have a fuse. So when they're overloaded, particularly in my experience with these particular transformers, they don't stand up to being overloaded very well. And I've actually seen them when they're shorted out, the windings will fry and you get this giant puff of smoke out of it that smells really bad. And it smells like burnt sugar on a pan on your stove. So that's kind of a problem. To make up the electrical side of things, we're going to use some standard electrical fittings and we're going to use a piece of flexible metal cable or metal clad cable that's going to connect to the side that she can wire in in place of her original transformer. Another reason I like this box was because it has these mounting tabs. There's four of them so it easily can sit flat against the wall and be screwed in place so it won't be flopping around and be a problem. So you can see there's quite a bit to all of this to do. Now I'm going to see if I can make it up and see what I can come up with. That's all. I'll be back in a while. Okay, so let's take a quick look at our actual transformer and then we're going to get started and see what we can build here. The th transformers always have two sides. They have a primary side, which is the high voltage side, and then they have the secondary side, which is the low voltage output. And if you look at the information sheet that comes with this transformer, you can see here on the primary side, the terminals are labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the secondary side are 5, 6, 7, and 8. So it's necessary, the primary side will have the 110, coming into it and the secondary side will have the 30 volts coming out of it. So we have to mount it in the box in the right direction and you can see here on the body of the transformer it's clearly labeled 1, 2, 3, 4 which is primary and 5, 6, 7, 8 which is secondary so that we don't make a mistake because when you turn it over this side looks both the same. I'm going to put a red dot on the primary side just as a reminder of that that's the, that's the primary side. So if we flip it over, one, two, three, four, red dots on the one, two, three, four side so we don't get it mixed up because there's no markings on this side. So this transformer is going to sit in our plastic box like this. And I think the first step to building this transformer will be to mount the transformer in the box. I'm going to mount it a little bit offset. I'm not, I could put it right in the middle. It's a little hard to see. I could place it right in the middle of this available space. But I'm actually going to offset it towards one end and away from the opening right here. This is where the electrical wires are going to come in from the junction box. This is the high voltage side. And I want to leave myself a little more room there. So I'm going to mount it offset a little bit. 
and the first part to do this is we need to drill some holes through the case so we can put mounting screws like these and put the transformer in place. So that's what I'm going to do now. And the way I'm going to do this is I, I place the box on a wooden piece of wood because I don't want to drill holes into my workbench. And all I'm going to do is just hold the transformer in place. And I have my cordless drill and I have a really long drill bit. And the reason I have a really long drill bit is because it allows me, I don't want the drill or the bit to crash into the transformer and damage it. So it makes it easier to just set it in place and start some holes. Like that. And the nice thing about the PVC box is it's very easy to drill and you can see it was that easy to drill the holes. So now what we have to do is we have to make sure the holes are the right size. Those are a little, that's a little small. So I'm gonna get another drill bit and we're gonna enlarge them a little bit. Okay, so with a slightly larger bit, we'll just check and make sure. See those slide through nicely now. You don't wanna thread it through the holes. You just want it to be able to drop through the holes like that because it's really the head and the nuts and washers that are going to hold it all together. Now the next step is going to be, since the whole purpose of this box with the mounting ears on it is, if you pretend that this is the customer's wall, this has to mount flat against the wall and then she can put screws in the ears to hold it in place and that makes it all secure. So to do that, if we use screws with heads that protrude, the heads stick up beyond the case, and that's not really what I'm looking for. I want them to be flush. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this. This is a countersink bit, and all it does, oh, these are flathead screws. So they're flat on the top and they're beveled on the bottom. And the countersink bit changes the whole shape from a hole to a countersink. So all you have to do, you can see that it takes like two seconds, and when you put the screw in it, now the head of the screw is flush with the back of the case. So we're gonna do each hole. And this box is nice and thick and heavy. So by drilling out the holes and doing the countersinks, you're not really weakening the box at all. Okay, and that's good. Now all the heads are flush. I want to make sure that it lines up with the holes in the transformers properly, which means we have to flip it over and slide the transformer down over the screws. Of course, if we flip it over like this, all the screws are going to fall out and we're going to fight it, and that's a pain in the neck. So let me show you how to deal with that. All we're going to do is we're going to take some blue masking tape, and we're going to put it over the back of the box to hold the screws in place. And then when we're done, we can just take this off. So now the screws are in place, they're in the box. And if we take our transformer and we know which side is the primary side because we put red dots on it, if we ta carefully take this, we can slide it down over the screws and it fits. So that's how the transformer is going to be mounted in the box. Now, one of the things that we should do, or are going to do, is let's take a quick look at the transformer a second, and then I'll show you how we're going to actually mount it. So here you can see these are the laminations, or the metal core of the transformer. Here are the pins at the top. And then you have the laminations, and then Wrapped around the laminations are these sort of yellowed colored plastic portions. These are the bobbins. And underneath the covering right here, this is where the wire is wrapped around and around and around the bobbins that make the coil that make the transformer work. So the laminations here are in the center of the bobbins 
and part of the bobbin is down here at the bottom. When we mount this in the box, we don't really want the transformer bobbin sitting against the inside of the box because that's kind of haphazard and not very well done. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some of these. These are little plastic standoffs and that's what the transformer, it makes like legs for the transformer. So when we install these, we're going to slip them down over the screws and then slip the transformer on. And it's a little hard to see, maybe this way. So if we put this like this, we've got about a little less than a quarter of an inch of space underneath between the bottom of the bobbin and the back of the case because of the standoff. And that's a nicer way to do it. So the transformer is sort of floating or sitting on the spacers. And that's a much nicer way to go. So in the end, the way that will work is... So here's our box and we have the four screws that we put in. We're going to put the spacers down over the screws. And then when we get ready to install the transformer, we'll slide it down over the screws and the transformer will sit on the spacers and it'll have air, an air gap underneath it and it makes it a much nicer installation. But before we do that, there's something else that we have to do. This was a very good choice of transformers for this project, but there is only one downside to it that, I've, that I can find. That is these pins. This transformer is designed to actually be mounted inside of a product and typically it would be attached to a circuit board. Here's a circuit board full of holes. This is a project board and if this were part of your product this transformer would would be sat down on the board, the pins would align with the holes in the board, and then it would be soldered in place, and then other components and wiring things would be hooked up, and it would be incorporated into a product using it this that way. We need to make it in a, in a hard wire application where there's actual wires that are connected between the pins. And it's not really proper to take a wire and try to wrap it around this little pin and solder it in place. It's going to be a weak connection and one of the rules in anything you do that involves soldering is solder is not structural. St solder on its own should never really be used to hold things together like metal parts or wires on pins. It's not a structural element. The wire should be carefully attached to whatever it's being soldered to. And if you look in old equipment that has a lot of point-to-point -point wiring, which is what we're really doing here, there would always be some sort of terminal strip or something with loops and holes in it that the wire could be wrapped through and then soldered in place. And so we're gonna replicate that and we're gonna do that with these. These are eyelets and they're metal and then they have a plastic cover over the end and where these typically would be used is you would take a wire and insert it into the bottom into the hole a bare wire and then you would use a crimping tool and you would crimp over the plastic cover and that would deform the metal sleeve where the wire is pushed in and that would crimp it onto the end of the wire and then it would go under a screw and be fastened into some kind of product or circuit or something. So we're going to do what's kind of an old trick and we're going to use these but we're going to use them in a slightly different way. What we're going to do is we're going to take these individually, we're going to need eight of them, and we're going to take them and we're going to slip them down over the pins and then we're going to solder it onto the pin which transforms our pin connection into a terminal type connection. So to do that, the first thing we have to do is we have to remove the red covering. Now, it's not proper or correct to put this on here and try to crimp it onto the pin. If you did that, one, the connection would be poor, and two, you run the risk of cracking the plastic bobbin, which would ruin your transformer. So we don't want to do that. So we're going to actually solder them in place. So to remove the outer covering, it's pretty easy. It might be a little hard to see. We'll try to keep our fingers out of the way. We'll take a utility knife, and we're just going to score the cover a little bit. And then 
we're just going to grab it and slide it off and it's that easy now you can see here's the metal sleeve part of the of the connector and this is the part that we're going to fit down over our pin and you can actually see the sleeve is slightly shorter and the pin actually protrudes up which is good because when we solder this we're going to end up with a really good connection it's a, it would be considered a mechanical connection because the sleeve goes all the way around the pin and the pin protrudes up so it's going to be soldered solidly in place let me go ahead and show you how to do the first one okay with our connector in place we're going to take our soldering iron and we're going to touch both the connector and the pin to heat it up and then we're going to touch a little bit of the solder to the tip of the soldering iron to melt it and that helps make a better heat connection and then you can see when it's ready you flow solder into it until you fill up the sleeve and there's just a little bit of solder that comes up out of the top now because the metal piece is rather large it will take a few seconds for it to cool down enough where the solder will harden and now this connector is solidly connected to the pin so that's the first one i have seven more of them to do i'm not going to do each one on camera when i'm back they'll all be in place okay so a few minutes have gone by and you can see here we have our eight soldered eyelet connections all soldered onto the eight pins of the transformer they're all facing the same way around so you have the flat sides on the outer part you have the on the inside you have the sleeve not that it really makes that much difference but i believe in uniformity and neatness and workmanship still counts sometimes so in this particular case that was the way i decided to do it so our next step is now to mount the transformer on the screws with the standoffs inside the box Okay, so we're going to take our transformer. We have our four screws with the standoffs in the box. We have our eyelets soldered onto our transformer terminals. We know which side is the primary side because it has the red dots on it. And all we have to do is slip it down over the screws carefully until the transformer is seated on the standoffs like that. And because we chose screws of, the, of a proper length, we have about a quarter of an inch of threads left showing on each side. Now for the next step, to do this properly, you should always use little lock washers and then screws. So I'm going to put the lock washer over the screw first and then the nut. And this is actually the part that sometimes is the trickiest to do because... If you have big fingers it gets to be kind of complicated hold on one second I'll be right back okay so I have to get the right screws I are the right nuts I had the wrong ones so we take our nut and we'll place it down over the end of the screw and the goal here is to just get it started enough so it doesn't fall off so there's one and it's hard because it's the screw is very close to the end of the bobbin on the transformer so there's not a lot of room and if you have big fingers it can be a little tricky and you've got to get it right otherwise it's going to be too hard to tighten up okay i think that one's okay now the ones on this side are going to be the most difficult because the space between the screw and the case is small and it's small because we did an offset so it's closer here than it is here but i wanted the extra room so let's see how well we can do here this is sometimes when having a magnetized screwdriver comes in handy and you sort of place it on there and then I know you probably can't really see but it's just a matter of getting the screw started or the nut started 
Now the nuts fell down inside, but we have to get them out. Another way to do this sometimes is, so we have this side already, the nuts already on. So what we're going to do is, we're going to turn it over, and we're going to tighten up these two screws a little bit. These are the ones that already have the nuts and the washers. And you can just, you don't have to take the blue tape off, you can just put the screwdriver through the tape to turn the screws a little bit. And then sometimes, our washer fell off. It's easier if you put the washer on and then you take the nut on a piece of tape and then you can sometimes get it down where you want it to go easier. See, the tape makes it stick. It's not really on the end of your finger, but it's kind of on the end of your finger. It's not going to fall off, hopefully. And then, if you hold the nut on the end of the screw, and you turn the screw, it threads itself on. Pretty good, huh? Okay, so that's three. Now we got one more to do. One more washer. Our last nut. Let's see if we can do this one with a pair of needle nose pliers. That. And then we'll turn the screw. All right, so now we've got all of them started. So the next thing I want to do is I want to take the tape off. I want to get actually to the screws, not through the tape. Get rid of that. And now we want to make sure that they're reasonably secure and snug. So let's see how our lock washers tighten up here. See, and sometimes on small screws like this, it'll, they won't tighten down well. because they want to spin. So then you can take a nut driver that's the right size and put it down over the screw, which helps hold it, and then you can tighten them down. They don't have to be super, super tight. They just have to be tight enough so they don't work loose. like that. So now our transformer is mounted in the box on its plastic standoff with threaded screws with nuts and washers to make sure they don't come loose and we have our eight soldered eyelet connections on the top of the transformer pins. Now we're ready to start wiring this up. Now that we have our transformer mounted in the box, it's time to do the high voltage side wiring to so we can connect the transformer to a power source. And to do that, th we're going to use this group of parts. This particular box has a single inlet on one side where conduit or other types of electrical connections can be inserted. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a short piece of PVC conduit, which will slip in like this. And then we're going to use this connector. This is a half inch threaded connector and it slips onto the PVC like this and it gives us a threaded connection here. Since in most houses transformers are mounted on metal electrical plates, you need some type of metal connection to when you re so when you remove the transformer you can connect this to the metal plate so what this is this is a piece of armored cable uh, it's a flexible cable one of the considerations on making up something like this is safety of course is important but it also 
has to adhere to whatever the electrical codes are for the area that it's going to be sent to. And since there are so many different codes, we're going to go with the national electrical code. And armored cable is always a good choice because it's, for the most part, universally acceptable for this type of work and that's why we're going to use it. It also being flexible allows the customer to mount this in one spot and then twist this around and connect it into wherever the existing transformer was. One of the things that would not be acceptable would be to simply use a piece of electrical wire like Romex and use a Romex pigtail and have the Romex exposed out in the open where it's in the accessible area in any part of a house. It should be done better than that and that's why we're going to use the armored cable. While I like the armored part of the cable really well, I don't necessarily like the wiring that's inside of the cable. This particular piece of armored cable has 12 or 14 gauge solid copper wire in it which is one very stiff two will make it much more difficult to wire into our transformer box and three it's for the most part unnecessary uh, what we're really doing here is we're not doing electrical wiring per se we're actually building an electrical device it's stated in the information sheet that comes with the transformer this transformer will draw a maximum of less than one amp and one amp is very small 14 gauge solid copper wire is used typically on 15 amp electrical circuits and since we're not going to be drawing 15 amps it won't be possible to because the transformer itself can't draw that much power we don't need wires this heavy so what we're going to do is we're going to take this out and this will become spare wire and we're going to use the armored cable and what we're going to put in place of the wire that was in the armored cable was is this this is a piece of 16 gauge, this is a power cord cable. And inside of it you have your black, white, and green ground wires. Ground is not that important in this case, but we will utilize that. And then it has a heavy uh, jacket over the outside of it. And fortunately, this will fit through our armored cable very nicely. except when it gets to the other end and it gets a little stuck. And so here's our flexible three wire cord through the armored cable. And then this will go in through this connection and then be wired up to the primary side of the transformer. To, do, to make the connection here between the metal and the plastic, we're gonna use a armor cable connector, which is this. And all you have to do is loosen the screws. We'll take the nut off of it. The nut would be used if you're mounting it to a metal electrical box or plate, but since we have a threaded plastic connection here, this simply will screw into the plastic piece, and that makes it really easy. That's why I chose all of this. So this will go through here, but before we do that, we have to add one of these. This is a plastic bushing, and the plastic bushing goes around the cord, and it slides down into the armored cable, and then you can take your cord and cable, put it into the connector, push it up against the stop here, and then tighten the screws down. The purpose of the plastic bushing is to protect the cord or cable from the sharp edge of the armored cable. And it's a necessary thing to do. It's more important to do when you have individual wires like this, because these just have a standard amount of insulation on them. This has insulation on each wire plus the outer jacket of the cable. So it has a lot of protection to start with, but good practice is put plastic bushings. So we'll do this. And there's our connection. Now before we insert this into the box, we need to take the jacket off the outside. And the easiest way to do that is you take your utility knife and you very carefully cut along the surface.
like that. And then you can peel back the outer covering and pull the wires loose. And then you just snip off the plastic covering and you're all set. So here are our three wires. We have our white, black, and ground. We'll put those in through here. Oh, when you make this up, the piece of pipe and the connector, this needs to be glued with PVC cement. I usually do that at the very end, and I'll show you why. So we have to pull the wires in. And then we'll thread this into the connection. Okay, and here's why I like to glue them after I put it together. So there are the screws that tighten the cable clamp onto the armored cable. And when this is installed on the customer's wall, the screw heads of the screw should be accessible, which means if you thread it together, then you can twist it so the screws are exposed. Then I'll slide it apart, put a little PVC cement, and glue it together. So that's just a practical thing, so you can always get to this later on. It's not pointed back towards the wall where you can't get to it, then you've got to take the whole box off, and it's a, it's a bother. So that's one end, and then at the other end, we have, this will be the, the, the end of the cable that wires into the customer's electrical circuit, and to make this up, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to leave about 8 inches of cable exposed, and we'll snip it off. And then we'll remove the outer jacket of the cable. And we'll snip off the outer jacket. And we need to remove a little more of the jacket because we have to put our bushing still. So we'll just very carefully score it. And peel it away. Like that. And now we'll straighten out our armored cable. We'll take our second bushing, put it around the wire, and slip it down into the armored cable to protect the wires. And then we're, at this end, we're going to use this connector. This is also an armored cable connector, but in this case, instead of being a straight connector, this is a 90 degree connector. And I'll show you why I chose that at the end of the video. So all you have to do is remove the screws and it's easier if you take this apart to put the wire through it instead of trying to have it make the right hand turn down through the hole put the wires down like this put the bushing against the tab put the cover on and put the screws back Like that. And now we have a right angle connector with our wires to be wired into the customer's electrical system. So now the armored cable and the wiring is all in place. Now we have to wire it up to the transformer. Okay, now that we have our high voltage wiring in place, it's time to wire up the primary side of the transformer. And since we're wiring this up for a 110 or 115 connection, we need to follow the instructions that came with the transformer. And it shows here that to wire the primary side for 115 volts, we need to put one leg, the black for instance, to pin one, 
but then we also need to make a jumper that goes across and connects to pin 3 and then the neutral or white wire will be connected to pin 4 with a jumper over to pin 2. If we were wiring it up for 230 volt then the jumpers and the wire locations would be different but we're doing 115 so we need to follow this layout so what we're going to do is for instance, here's our hot, our black, and it's going to go on pin 1, which is here. And we're going to see, see how you can wrap the wire in through the, in through the eyelet now. Instead of trying to solder it onto the straight pin, we have a place to make a solid connection. So that's how we're going to do these. But we need to make sure that this is done safely. And right now, these four connections on the primary side, when the, when the transformer is wired into the customer's electrical outlet, there'll be high voltage here. And we don't want these terminals to be exposed so what we're going to do is after as we prepare to assemble this we're going to use this this is heat shrink tubing which acts as an insulator just like the insulation on the wire and we're going to slip it down over it and we're going to shrink it in place to make sure it doesn't pull off so let me show you how that's done so here's our terminal number one and here's our hot wire from the electrical system and here's our second wire and these need to go together under that eyelet and then be soldered on because this one is going to be the jumper wire. So to do this, put the wires together, we need to take a piece of the heat shrink tubing and we need to slip it down over the wires before we put them in the eyelet otherwise we won't be able to slide it down. And then we're going to take both wires, put them through the eyelet and then we're going to bend them around and remember I talked about how solder is not a structural connection. Well, when you wrap the wires around the eyelet like this, it's now positively connected to the eyelet. It needs to be soldered, but it's actually physically held in place because the wire is wrapped around it. So once we get it to that point, we're going to take our soldering iron and we're going to put it up against the connector and the wire so it can heat both of them. After a few seconds, we'll touch a little bit of solder. That helps to make better heat transfer. And then you simply flow the solder to the connection. Now, one of the things that will happen on this is because you're reheating it, the eyelet where it's soldered on the pin may become loose because you've melted the solder down in the eyelet again also. And so you have to hold it in place until it sets and then it's fine. Now at this point, this connection is still relatively hot because we just soldered it. And we don't want to put our heat shrink tubing down over it to cover it yet because heat shrink means it shrinks when it gets hot and we don't want it to shrink as we try to slide it down over the connection. So we'll let that cool a little bit and while we're doing that, waiting for that, we're going to take our jumper wire, which is this one, and we're going to solder it onto pin number three. So first we'll strip it back. and we'll twist the strands together. This is stranded wire. We'll put a little piece of heat shrink tubing on it. We'll slide it through the eyelet. See if we can get that to focus better. Through the eyelet, we're gonna bend it around so we have a strong physical connection. And then we're gonna solder it. And there we have it. So now we have these two connections made. So let me go ahead and I'm going to slide the heat shrink tubing down over this one. Okay, so we have our wire soldered and we have our heat shrink tubing down over the two 
eyelet connectors and now we're going to shrink the tubing to seal them up. So I have my heat gun here and if you watch the tubing you'll see how it shrinks up and grabs the eyelet connectors as I heat it up. So there's the first one. And the second one will be easier to see. So here's the heat shrink tubing right here. And we'll heat it up. And it shrinks around the connector and the wires. To hold them in place. Once you've done that, once it cools, it won't typically pull off because it's it's shrunk around the connection and the wire so it's held in place heat shrink tubing like this usually is rated at at least 400 volts for insulation some of it six this is heavier so it's 600 volt so now the connections the high voltage connections on the primary side of the transformer are covered up so now i'm going to go ahead and wire up the neutral connections here and the jumper here and i'll be right back okay so i wired the the neutral, the white neutral wire to pin number two, and then I made a jumper that went over and connected to pin number four, and I put heat shrink tubing on all of those connections. So all of the high voltage connections on this side are in place and they're all covered. So our next step is to move on to the secondary side or our 30 volt side of the transformer, which are these four connections here. To achieve the 30 volts that we're looking for, we're going to be wiring these in a series connection, which means that our output pins for the 30 volts will be pins 6 and 7, but we do have to add jumpers between pins 5 and 8 to make the proper connections. So I think what I'll do here is I'm going to do the jumper first and then I'll do the, the two output pins. But before we do that, we have to have a place to output the voltage to. Right now, this is all inside of a sealed plastic box and how is the customer going to hook her intercom up to it? Well, that's what I'm going to show you next. Since we need an output connection for the 30 volts somewhere on the outside of the box, there's a couple different ways to do it. I suppose that if you were being quick and easy about it, you simply could drill a hole and route some wires from the output connections through the hole and then wire nut them onto the wires that go to her intercom, but I don't think that's a very good way to do it. I would rather have something that meant that it was a this was a well done and permanently made item and it had some kind of a proper connections here on the outside that the wires from the intercom could easily be disconnected from if it needed to be or this needed to be removed for some reason. So what I've decided to use is this. This is a two terminal barrier strip and it's a surface mount so it's going to sit on the outside of the box like this and then protruding into the box there are two tabs, one for each terminal, with holes in the tabs where wires can be inserted and soldered in place. And what I want to do is I'm going to mount that here on the side of the box just like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the width that the hole needs to be so the tabs will fit through. I suppose if you wanted to get really fancy about it, you could try to drill two small screw holes, but I don't think that there's much of a payoff in doing that. I think one hole through the case is probably just as good. And then to drill a large hole like that in something, the best thing to use is your Unibit, which has a variety of different steps and drills different sizes. So I'm going to, going to go ahead and drill that. And that's close to our marks. So let's see how our tabs fit. It's a little snug. We'll go one step bigger. And now we can just slide them through and it fits very nicely. There's plenty of exposed tabs on the inside to make our wire connections. So now we need to fasten this to the box. So the easiest way to do that is with it in place. 
Of course, it always is good if you make sure it's straight. You can just use the holes in the strip as a template to start some holes and then we'll drill them through. And then we'll check and see if the holes are big enough for our screws. And I think these are probably going to be a little small. So then we'll just enlarge them a little bit. And now our screws should fit through just fine, and they do. So we'll go ahead and put the screw through the box. And we'll put a nut And then we'll go ahead and put a washer. And again, working in tight spaces is always exciting. But once you get it in, it'll be easy. And then we'll start the nut. You know, a lot of this kind of stuff is actually much easier to do when you're not making a video about it. because I have to stand off to the right so you can sort of see what I'm doing and that makes it more complicated. I'll tell you what, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So we have our barrier strip screwed to the outside of the case. We have nuts and washers on the inside holding it in place so it's not gonna pull off the box or anything like that if something happens and somebody pulls on the wires or who knows what. Uh, and you would think now, well, let's wire up the secondary side and be done with this. Well, not quite yet. We have one more hole to drill and since we already have the unit bit out, now is a good time to do it. So if you remember from the first part of the video, the reason we're doing this is because the transformer for my customer is 2540 got fried because her master station failed and it overloaded the transformer and burnt it out. So I don't want that to happen to this. The odds of it happening two times on the same person's intercom is pretty slim, but if I'm making this up for someone else, we don't know how it's going to be used or what could possibly happen. So I think a really good thing to do is to add a fuse. And this is a panel mount fuse holder. And we're going to put an appropriate size fuse. And we're not going to fuse the high voltage input side of the transformer. We're going to fuse the 30 volt output side of the secondary. And that way, if a customer's intercom has some kind of dramatic catastrophe failure and it overloads the transformer, instead of burning the transformer up after we went through all this trouble to construct this, it will simply blow the fuse. So I'm going to put the fuse over here on this side of the box because there's plenty of room for it and it seems like a good idea. So I'm going to do basically the same thing. I'm going to drill a hole with a unibit and I'm going to put this in place and it has solder tabs on it for wiring and then we'll wire up the secondary. So again, I'll be right back. Okay, so now our fuse holder is in place and this is an old school type of fuse holder where you just twist the cap and it comes off and the fuse will go inside the cap and then be inserted. Now we can go ahead and wire up the secondary and finish this project up. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the jumper that needs to be between pins number five and pin number eight here. Since the secondary side of the transformer is low voltage, it's only 30 volts, the wire gauge, the heaviness of the wire doesn't need to be as large as the primary side because altogether the maximum that can be drawn through these wires is 0.8 or 8 tenths of an amp or for those of you who are interested it's 800 milliamps and so an 18 gauge wire is plenty large enough and that's also most likely the size of the wire that will run from the terminal connections here to the customer's 2540. So I'm going to do this in the same way I'm going to simply insert the wire through the eyelet 
and then solder it and put a piece of heat shrink tubing on it. So we'll insert it in, twist it around and solder it. It's the same identical thing as I did on the primary side. So we'll set this in place. We'll go ahead and solder it. We'll let it cool. We'll put the heat shrink tubing over it and I'll make the jumper over it. And in fact, on this one, you have to put two pieces of heat shrink tubing because I need one on this side and one on that side. So I'll slide two pieces on. So I'm gonna make this up and then I'll be right back. Okay, so I have my first output connection for our 30 volts connected up. The, the wire is soldered here onto pin number six and it's soldered here on the right hand barrier strip terminal and there is heat shrink tubing over both connections so there are no ex exposed connections. One of the goal of a project like this is you don't want any open or exposed connections. You want everything to be covered up. So the last part to do is the second output and the second output has to be treated somewhat differently than the one I just did. Our second output on the transformer is pin number seven which is here but it's not going to go directly to the barrier strip terminal here because we want the output to be fused. So number seven is the wire from number seven is going to travel here to the connection on the fuse at the end and then off the tab here on the fuse body it's going to go to our output terminal here on the left. So it's two more wires to install and there will be a piece of heat shrink tubing over the fuse body to cover up these connections also and now I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay I'm back. So I have finished the internal wiring of our replacement transformer. I wired the second output from pin number seven to the input of the fuse body and then from the output of the fuse body to our second terminal strip here on the left. I put heat shrink tubing over everything including the body of the fuse holder so the connections on the bottom and on the side are not exposed and that completes our wiring with one small exception. So we still have here floating around this green ground wire and this will bring up some questions for some people as to what to do with it and does it need to be incorporated into the way this is designed. My answer to this is no and if you look at it from a reasonable point of view since the ground wire goes through the armored cable and is then wired into the customer's electrical system which is most likely a grounded system everything up to the end of the of the connector here where it's threaded into the plastic connector is grounded so all of the exposed metal is grounded everything after this is in plastic there is no exposed metal and there's no really a good place to connect this and it doesn't really need to be connected because it'll be connected back at the junction when it's wired into the electrical system but not wanting to just cut this off what I did was I put a piece of heat shrink tubing over the end and just shrunk it down to seal off the end of it and all I'm going to do is coil this up and put it down inside it's not going to hurt anything being in there and if for some reason it was needed later on it's easy enough to do so that's what it takes to construct a transformer to replace a 30 volt 20 watt transformer for a new tone 2540 we have a little bit to do still to finish this up let's go ahead and put the cover on it and then we'll talk about the fuse the purpose of putting the fuse on the output of our newly constructed replacement transformer is to protect the transformer from being overloaded and burning up. It doesn't do any good if you put a fuse that's too large. To calculate the rating that the fuse should be, the fuse should always be slightly under the maximum output of the transformer. And if we look on the information sheet that came with the transformer, we can see that at 24 volt, or 30 volts at 24 watts or VA, the maximum output of the transformer is 800 milliamps. 800 milliamps is 8 tenths of 1 amp. And so you want a fuse that's very slightly under the 800 milliamp rating. And the closest fuse that you can commonly buy for that would be a 750 milliamp fuse. And that's what we're going to use in our replacement transformer. So this is a standard 
glass fuse. And all you have to do is take the cap off, you insert the fuse into the cap, and then you put it back in the fuse holder, and twist it, and it locks in place. Now, if the output here is shorted for just a brief amount of time, and it begins to overload the transformer as soon as the overload reaches 750 milliamps or three quarters of one amp the fuse will blow the output will be shut off and the transformer is protected so let's go ahead and power up our transformer and check and see if we did our job properly. Since it will be difficult for me to show you the transformer output and the multimeter at the same time, I'm going to demonstrate here what I'm going to do and then I'm going to let you watch the multimeter. So once we power this up, all I'm going to do is put the probes on the two terminals like this and that will create a reading on the multimeter that will tell us what the output of our new transformer is. All right, I have our replacement transformer hooked up to my bench power supply and we're going to power it at 115 volts AC which would be nominal voltage for most people's homes so we'll go ahead and I'm going to flip the power on you're not going to see any change in the meter because the probes aren't hooked up yet there's no flame shooting out and the circuit breaker in the shop didn't trip which means we got our high voltage side of the wiring done correctly and the power supply shows is drawing almost no current at all which is what you would expect now i put the black probe on one terminal of the barrier strip and now i'm going to touch the second one and you can see the meter shows 36.5 volts ac now you might think at this point oh no something's wrong Something was done incorrectly because it's supposed to be a 30 volt transformer and we're getting 36 volts. Why is that? Well, transformers are rated at their maximum power output. So right now, the multimeter isn't using any real power. It's just measuring the voltage. When you connect a device to the transformer and the device starts to use power from the transformer, the voltage will drop. And I've actually already tried a setup like this on the customer's 2540 at nominal volume with six speakers connected to the master station the voltage on the transformer dropped down to about 32 volts which is what I would expect. One of the things you have to keep in mind is this is not what I would refer commonly to as a NASA quality transformer. This is not a transformer that you're going to send into space and go to Mars with or something like that. This is an average transformer and most average electrical or electronic components. They have a tolerance of plus or minus 10%, 15%, 20%. And the products that they're powering have taken that into consideration. So a 30 volt transformer that under use is putting out 32 is perfectly normal. Now what I'm going to do to demonstrate to you that our fuse protection will work is I'm going to short with the probes connected so you can see the voltage. We're at 36.5 and it's holding pretty steady. I'm going to go ahead and use my needle nose pliers here. And I'm going to short across the output and we're going to see if the fuse blows or if the transformer blows up. So ready, one, two, well, no, let's do it this way. Okay, so this will be much more fun this way, I think. So here's our transformer, here's our terminal strip. It's still powered up and if I put the probes back on it, we're still outputting 36 and a half volts. I've connected one wire to one side of the barrier strip and here's the bare end of the other wire. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to touch the other screw terminal to see if we overload the transformer or if we blow the fuse. But to make this more interesting, let's do it in the dark. Okay, so now it's really hard to see. So you can see my finger, the shiny parts are the terminal strips and we're gonna go ahead and touch one of them, the wire to the empty terminal and see what happens. Oh, well, you know, we got a spark and another spark and another spark. And now uh, no more sparks. The fireworks show is over. Let's find out why. Okay, lights back on, probes on the terminal strip. Output voltage is now nothing. 
it's virtually zero. It's not exactly zero because my meter reads really, really, really low voltages, but for all intents and purposes, it's zero. So let's see what happened. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that we blew our fuse. So let's go ahead and take our fuse cap off and we'll pull it out and see what we got inside. So here's our fuse in the cap and if we pull it out, see if everybody can maybe see this. All right, so now you can see the glass fuse. You can see the body of the glass here and inside the little wire is the actual fuse element. And if you look up here near the top, you can see how the glass is discolored on the inside and it might be kind of hard to see, but that's where the fuse blew, right down in there. So our the purpose of our fuse and fuse holder worked. We overloaded the transformer. Those were the little sparks you got to see. And instead of blowing up the transformer, say like that happened in the customer's house, we blew the fuse and said. So instead of having to replace the entire transformer, you get to replace an 85 cent glass fuse. So that's pretty good. Oh. We were successful by doing this. So our replacement transformer construction is a success. We have a safely enclosed, properly rated transformer that will work on Newtone models 2540, 2090s, 2063s, and all the other Newtone or intercoms that use 30 volt 20 VA transformers. I think it's a good, well-constructed unit. The very last thing to do, which I'm not gonna do here at the shop, I'm actually gonna have Cindy do it when I take it back to the office tomorrow, is we need to label this because people need to know what this is for. If you just install this in a furnace closet or someplace without any information on it, who's gonna know what it's all for and that it's actually important? So we'll put on the face, because she has one of those fancy printing label maker things, that it's a, low voltage power transformer for the new tone 2540 transformer on this side on the high voltage input we'll put a label that says for use with 115 volts ac only on the output side we'll put that the output is 30 volts at 24 watts because that's the actual rating of the transformer and the most important one, I think, is we'll put a label here under the fuse holder that says use only 750 milliamp flow blow fuses in the fuse holder. That way somebody won't come along and whack in a 4 amp fuse, which is like five times what it should be. And then instead of blowing the fuse, you'll burn up the transformer. I hope you found this video to be interesting and helpful. If you have a transformer problem from an, for an older Newtone intercom system and you can't find the proper replacement, you can get a hold of us and we might have a solution for it. If you like our videos and find them to be interesting, please give them a thumbs up on YouTube. You can leave comments and questions down below and I do answer all of the questions. This video is ad free as is our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, it means more people will find our videos and we can help them also. That's all for today. See you on the next video. Okay, I forgot one important part of the whole thing. So this is the addendum. This is what you get for sticking around and watching the whole video. So we, early in the video when we were doing the power cable connection, I talked about using this right angle connector and here are the wires that are gonna get wired into the customer's electrical system. And the reason I chose this was most transformers in most houses are mounted like one of these two. These are both small Newtone doorbell transformers, but the idea is identical. This one is mounted on a single gang metal electrical plate, and this one is mounted on a three, three and a half inch round metal plate. And all of these types of transformers are held onto the plate with a clamp on the back. And if you take the, loosen the screw, the transformer comes off the plate. We don't need that. And the same thing on the round plate. We'll put that over there. So now we have two electrical plates with round holes in them. One here and one here. 
And that's where this comes in and works out really well. What you have to envision is that this is mounted usually on the wall. This is like on the surface of the sheetrock and the electrical box is in the wall cavity behind it. So when you take the transformer off, you already have a proper box. You already have a nice heavy duty metal cover and you have a hole in it that can, that can be reused. So what you do is you take this, you take the nut off the connector and this will go in through the plate, through the hole in the plate, and it will sit like this. And then you put the nut back on the back side. And that holds it in place. And then this is screwed back to the electrical box. The reason I like the right angle connector is instead of the cable shooting straight out of the of the plate like this and then it's got to make a loop to go back to the wall or something which is kind of messy especially if there's not a lot of extra room if you do it this way this can mount on the wall here this is on the wall here and and the cable is basically flat against the sheetrock you can put a clamp to hold the middle part of the cable loop down here against to the sheetrock if you want to. But this just brings it out of the plate against the wall, which is what you really want instead of sticking out. That's the reason I use this. So this is how it would typically be installed. That's the bonus footage for how to build a transformer. And thanks for sticking around.